I was very struck by a comment that uh, Jim Gibney made to me just a, a number of days ago when he was uh, talking about this legacy consultation and he described people uh, sitting on the emotional edge of their seats. Meaning that here we go with another consultation 10 years after Eames Bradley and uh, not knowing uh, what's going to happen next. And I think everyone in this uh, platform understands that when we step into rooms uh, such as this, uh, we're in the company of people who were touched by uh, the hurt and the hell of, of several decades of conflict. And I think, I think we need to acknowledge that. We, that this community has been hurt as other communities have been hurt, including the policing community, the loyalist community, the Republican community, the unionist and nationalist community. So I think all of that goes without saying. Uh, the past is our unfinished piece. Uh, and in the waiting and, and, and Bill made uh, some reference to this, uh, we're losing living memory, critical living memory. And the last time I was here with George, uh, Martin McGuinness was on that, uh, that platform with us. So we never know, we don't know uh, what's on uh, the next page. I've been, uh, over the years, compiling a bit of an archive since I left the BBC of the stuff I've gathered over, over many years and I hadn't got round to looking into these boxes of cassette tapes that I have, boxes upon boxes of them. And my sister picked up this cassette player from a car boot sale a few weeks ago. And in the last few days, I've been listening to interviews I recorded with David Irvine, Martin McGuinness, Plum Smith, young Jerry Adams talk about Albert Reynolds and Alec Reid, listening to Robin Eames talk about Roy McGee, uh, others uh, who were critical to that period, 94 to 98, the, the unionist political leaders of that period, Jim Molyneux and, and Ian Paisley, no longer with us. Uh, Brian Keenan, uh, the Republican leader. And when you listen to those cassettes, it dawns on you that you're listening to the dead. And, and that's what I mean about in this wait for the past, we're losing so much in terms of uh, critical memory. But I think the other important point to make is that along the way in this peace process, the impossible has become possible. And just think about the decommissioning process, the disappeared, uh, the report of uh, Chris Patton. And we never know what's, what's around the corner in terms of, of what's achievable. So in terms of the, the past, let, let's not give up. Let's not, let's not give up. I can remember in March 1999, Bertie O'Hearn and uh, Tony Blair had just arrived at, at Hillsborough. Nelson Mandela was on the phone to Seamus Mallon, David Trimble, and Jerry Adams. And in the middle of that, I got a call from the IRA. And I went to West Belfast, and I assumed I was going to be told something about the, uh, the political process, the political negotiation, or about uh, decommissioning. But, but this was the statement I noted in, in March 1999 in, in the company of the uh, P. O'Neill of that period. It's, it's four or five pages. But it's the IRA talking about the investigation into the disappeared, <coughs> believing at that stage they had discovered the, war, the whereabouts of nine of the, of the graves. And after years of hopelessness, that statement at least began a process where many and most of the uh, remains of the, of the disappeared have been recovered. Others yet to be recovered. And again, that is part of our, our unfinished piece. Would we have had a disappeared process without a commission, without protected information? Would we have had a decommissioning process uh, without a commission and without interlocutors to the uh, IRA and loyalist organizations? Would we have had the, the outcome of the Patton Report, the removal of the RUC title and uh, symbols, if Chris Patton had been asked to achieve a five-party and governmental uh, consensus? The answer to that question is no. Those processes have worked and worked because they batted away political interference and political demands. John de Chastelin refused the demands for photographs and inventories in terms of, of decommissioning. And what is the lesson in all of that? That if you design the right process, then there is a chance that you will achieve results. 
This process in the past has been far too political and it is far too political. And, and that, is, that is, I think, uh, what has stopped the wheel that Eames Bradley designed uh, almost 10 years ago from turning. So we've got our panel here today, um, Judith Thompson, the, uh, the Victims Commissioner, Professor Louise Malander, who, along with a small group of uh, academics, have been looking at the pieces of the jigsaw pieces of the, uh, the legacy legislation and, and, and trying to see what sort of picture it forms. And uh, I know some of Louise's colleagues are, are here with her today. Louise, uh, a summer transfer from, uh, from the Ulster University to the Queen's University and, and, and that to, uh, that to uh, I think, begin in September. Is that right, Louise? And then, of course, we have uh, the Chief Constable, George Hamilton, uh, the Loyalist Winston Irvine, and uh, the Republican, Sean Murray. And the question for that panel discussion is will investigation and information retrieval bring us any closer uh, to the truth of the uh, conflict years? I think they all understand there, there are going to be some difficult questions for them today. We're not here for a cosy chat. I thought given the fact that the questions would be quite difficult, I, I, I thought a bit like the game show on TV, could we offer them a number of options? Could they ask the audience, for instance? And I thought if George asks the audience, There'd be no response. Uh, and then I, I wondered about the other two phoning a friend. And uh, would they give us the name of the friend they were phoning? Uh, or would they get a code name uh, and, uh, and, and, and that they would have to ring us? But remarkably, those two have the same friend, Glenn Bradley, uh, who's, in our, who's in our audience. And even if Glenn didn't know the answer, I, I think Glenn would be able to give us a few words that would convince us that he does know the answer. So, We'll see, how the, we'll see how the event develops. Judith's going to speak first of all about the importance of the, of the consultation, what she thinks needs to happen, and then beyond the consultation, what needs to happen next. So the Victims Commissioner, Judith Thompson. Good afternoon, everybody. Dealing with the past is the unfinished piece of our piece. And what I want to do to open this conversation is to offer some thoughts as to how we've arrived at this situation and why we haven't dealt with this in 20 years since the peace process. So four decades of conflict in Northern Ireland saw 3,720 people lose their lives. We saw, and that was during the period of 1988 to 2006, 66 to 2006. More than 40,000 people were injured. We have higher levels of PTSD in Northern Ireland of all countries that have produced comparable data, including USA, other Western European countries, and countries that have experienced civil conflict in their recent history. An estimated 39% of the population here have experienced some traumatic conflict-related event. And yet, dealing with the past was not part of the Good Friday Agreement. Negotiations were difficult enough without trying to deal with this stuff as well. And that, at that time, might have been the right decision. But I would argue that as we push this down the road, it gets heavier, not lighter. So at this stage, 20 years down, we're still looking to action a set of proposals to help us deal better with what went before. And this is not, this is not a one-off or a recent or the first attempt. This, I would say, is an iteration of conversations that went through the Bloomfield Commission and in their report, we will remember them. They were there again in the consultative group on the past. And in many, many ways, I would argue that the, the origin, the genesis of what we're looking at now was there in that Eames Bradley report. And we know how difficult a landing that report had. So when Richard Haas and Megan O'Sullivan did another report and talked again to victims and survivors and produced their report in 2013, a further and more developed but similar theme, a similar set of recommendations was there. Those recommendations were discussed by all the parties and in 2014 we had the Stormont House Agreement. And this legislation, which sits in front of us now, 
waiting to be finalized, refined, and put into action is really the end of that long journey, or at least the point we're at now in this long journey. So all of these follow common themes, and there is a really simple reason for that. If you go out and walk, as so many of you in this room will know better than anybody, to people who've been harmed, different people want different things. But I would say some very common themes emerge. People want, in many, many cases, to have access to information about what happened to people they loved. Some people would like to see those who did it punished, but not everybody. Some people want to know the truth. Some people perhaps feel they better, feel that they feel better not knowing. But I don't know anyone who would like to deny that information to somebody else, even if they personally don't want it. And I haven't met many people, if anyone, who says they wouldn't like some proper recognition of the harm that happened to them. And I can't tell you how many people have talked to me in ways that still shock me about victims being blamed. Still shock me that people, so many people, had something really bad or lost someone they loved. And the next thing that happened to them was that in some way, shape or form, that was laid at the door of themselves or the person they loved. So recognition isn't just about blame. Recognition is about saying, this happened, it shouldn't have happened. We recognize it was not the fault of who it happened to. That we as a society will move on in a way which seeks to care for, respect, and make good insofar as we can to people who are harmed. That fundamentally, I think, is what these mechanisms are designed to try and achieve. Now that doesn't mean they're the right shape, or that if they're not done the right way that they'll achieve it. They've got to be done the right way, and they've got to be refined right. But I think it is so important to remember, in what is too often a kind of bipolar debate about victims and survivors, that actually there is a core of things which human beings get that each other need to move forward from traumatic and wrong and terrible lives. So, it's not surprising that those reports went in a common direction, because there was a genuine attempt, and there has been over many, many years, to try and capture a set of mechanisms that would do some of these things. For people who've been harmed, no matter who they are, and no matter who harmed them. And that bit is really important. However, victims and survivors, these issues, and for the individuals, often it feels like them personally, have been pushed down the road so many times that I think we're at a point where there is a real lack of trust and faith in the willingness of governments, of political institutions, of our justice sector sometimes. I'm not arguing that's right because I don't think it is. But I think that lack of faith is there, that, that lack of trust is probably one of the most toxic, <coughs> difficult things we have in our politics at the moment, in our communities at the moment. And I genuinely believe that dealing with this stuff better is part of turning that in the right direction. And why should people trust things that let them down again and again? And it's very, very hard to say to people, look, we're trying to find a better way of doing this. Particularly when it means having to at least try to engage with something that you've had bad experiences with. <coughs> So, so I get that this is a very, very difficult ask for people who've been harmed. But if we don't do it, I don't know what the alternative is. So I've got a set of principles here. And these are the principles that I would invite you to judge these proposals by. Because these principles have been agreed by two victims and survivors forums, people who come from different backgrounds, harmed by different people. And I think these principles should stand for you, regardless of who you are, regardless of who harmed you. So anything that is put in place to help people who've been harmed needs to be co-designed with them. That doesn't mean that people make decisions about what happens to the person who's harmed, because I think that's something they shouldn't be asked to do. But they should have confidence that these institutions have been designed with them in mind. And that not 
not just the legislation, but what happens after. They decide with their own minds. They must be victim-centred and victim-led. If we have a historical investigations unit, if it produces those thousands of investigations, one or two or maybe more, the major output on those investigations will be information, reports and acknowledgement to families if they want them. So design it with those families in mind. Because <coughs> I'm not arguing that a big chunk of these cases will go to court. I think looking for evidence that proves beyond reasonable doubt a long time after the event is hard to do. I think the principle's important. I think sometimes it may be doable. I think it's wrong to tell people it will always be different. But I think we can do better than we've done. And we can offer people information if they want it. And we can certainly try and put that acknowledgement and that end of that victim blaming into the public space. It must be independent and impartial. And I agree everything that, that Brian said earlier about you cannot have a victim's process, a justice process, that has any political friends. None. Cannot be. It must be independent, it must be impartial, it must deal with people's cases, evidence, and investigations as it finds them, go where it takes them, and not with the protection of any particular group of people in mind. But it must be done with the benefit of those who suffered in mind. It must be inclusive and it must be fit for purpose. And, and I think that this debate may be in the room already. <coughs> those things don't always run easily together. There are about 1,700 deaths, which are, I think, sort of expected to be within the remit of investigations. The other institutions have no limits on them, and they're open to everybody. But investigations, that's the kind of number envisaged. We've already said there were people who died at the scene of events, and we think they should also be included. That's about another 25 people. Others have said, well, what about people who got reports from the historic investigation, sorry, HET, historical inquiries team? Many people with very good reason weren't happy with those reports. So how many of them do we do again? And then you move out in those circles. And I think the debate we haven't resolved yet is how wide can we go and say realistically this is fit for purpose and we can do it, and at the same time say it's as inclusive as we can make it. So fit for purpose and inclusive as we can make it. And that's, those are the two final principles we need to look at. And while I'm talking about, and we will be talking today, about what is in these proposals, I want to highlight one thing which is not in them, and that is a pension for those who are severely injured, unable to earn a pension, to earn their living, and those people are still waiting to have their case dealt with, to have a pension, to have a living wage, to have a way of managing. That's unacceptable. You can't deal with all these other difficult things and fail to provide financially an amount of money which is not difficult in our terms for people who've been that badly harmed. So whilst that is not part of these proposals, it should be, it needs to be progressed, and it's very much part of our agenda as a commission. But as we move these things forward, as we have these conversations, there are a couple of things that I think we just really need to stick with. Those principles apply no matter who you are, no matter who was harmed, no matter who did it. <coughs> if something is going to work, it's got to be independent and impartial and victim focused. And we cannot, we cannot build good ways of setting up institutions to deal with the past, which are based on blame. This is not a conversation about blame. If these debates are shaped by a wish to point the finger in this direction or that direction, or how many of those will be captured if we do it this way? Or how many of these will be captured if we do it this way? If that's the, the debate, then we will design bad institutions. It's got to be done in a way that has no friends, is fair, impartial, and looks after people who were harmed, no matter who they are and no matter who harmed them. That's got to be the bottom line. And an awful lot of what I think has shaped our conversation around this, and I think this is a bit like what Barney said about it being too politically led. Too much of it has been about which narrative will be served. 
who will look most to blame? That is not a question which helps the person who's been harmed. Then she go with a fair, transparent, decent process that follows the fact, the evidence. So that's that's where I think this conversation needs to turn and be different. So I'm going to finish there. I think what I'm saying to you all is you're about to hear, <coughs> you know, a debate about a set of fairly complicated proposals. But what's really simple and really matters is. This is stuff we haven't dealt with. We've come to the edge of it so many times. If we don't this time, I don't know where we will. And if we don't do it this time, I'm certain that in 10 years' time, we'll be sitting here having this conversation or we'll be somewhere else. So I think we need to do it. I think we know what victim survivors need. We need to do it. And I think for this consultation, please engage with it. Please be critical. There's a lot that can be changed or improved about the ways we set out. But remember, it's designed to serve those people who were harmed, which is most of us. It's got to be fair and impartial and free from political interference, and it's got to be victim centered. So, and I don't think there is any alternative. I think we need to do this, but I think we need to do it now. Thank you. Okay, Judith, so thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. Uh, you can hear us. That's good. I'm going to just chat a little bit to uh, Louise Malander now, Professor Malander, uh, about one of the issues that, uh, that Judith didn't touch on in her presentation, although not part of the uh, consultation, certainly a big part of the conversation, is this issue of a statute of limitations uh, or an amnesty. And uh, so we've had a defence committee report. We've had another inquiry, I think, Louise, mm -hmm. just completed. Mm -hmm. We have the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee mm -hmm. wanting to know why the statute of limitations hasn't been uh, part of this consultation. And of course we have, across some of the newspapers in Britain, uh, front pages uh, which, uh, which, which, which is about, in their terms, protecting armed forces from a, from a, from a witch hunt. So Louise, explain to us wh where you think we're at with this uh, statute of limitations conversation. And, and what a statute of limitations is should it come into should it come into play? Well, I guess in general terms, in most countries, the statute of limitations is a normal part of the criminal justice system. Its goal is to try and balance the rights of victims to have their case heard with the rights of defendants to be tried within a prompt and reasonable time. And normally speaking, a statute of limitations ensures there is ample time and opportunity for charges to be brought against someone, and it then sets up a limit after which char um, charges cannot be brought. In most cases, the exact duration of that limit will vary depending on the seriousness of the crimes, and the for really for international crimes such as war crimes and crimes against humanity, international law says there cannot be a statute of limitations. Uh, for other serious offences, generally speaking, you could be looking at two or three decades before a statute of limitations could be applied in other legal systems. Of course, in the UK, there's no tradition of doing this at all for any criminal offences. So in terms of where we're at here in, in the proposals, I think it's quite clear that what's being proposed isn't how a statute of limitations would normally be understood in other societies. This debate is coming from a number of different concerns of different people. It's not just coming from the launching of criminal proceedings against former soldiers for, for, um, for cases related to the troubles in Northern Ireland, although clearly that is one trigger for this, but it's also a response to investigations at the International Criminal Court for the actions of British soldiers in Iraq and elsewhere. So there's a number of different tensions going on with this, but and there's a number of different proposals on the table around what it could look like. But I think it seems clear that if a statute of limitations was introduced that prevented any proceedings being brought for things that happened, say, 10, ten or more years ago, and it meant, meant with an immediate effect that there, there could be no more trials, then that would be an amnesty. You could not say that in most of these cases people have had ample, there may have been ample time, but there certainly hasn't been ample opportunity for those cases to be properly heard in many, in many instances, here in Northern Ireland, also in Iraq and elsewhere. And so it would be an amnesty. But what's, I think, even more problematic is, normally speaking, amnesties are exceptional measures. They're a one-off measure. 
It was introduced for a particular set of offences that happened in the past. This isn't what's on the table here. This is a statute of limitations that would be permanent, that would be part of the criminal justice system going into the future. And so it would create impunity, not just for crimes that have happened in the past, but potentially for crimes that could involve British forces um, for an unspecified period of time. And, and a statute of limitations mm. that would be permanent. And the Defence mm. Committee, which made mm. the original proposal mm. in September, or sorry, in April 2017, mm -hmm. uh, clearly understood that to do it for the armed forces, you've got to apply it across the board. So mm. their, their, their second uh, recommendation was mm. that it should also apply to the RUC and other security personnel. Mm -hmm and that a government, after uh, whatever it was, a suitable uh, consultation, mm -hmm. may consider uh, applying it across the board. Mm -hmm. So this, this, this statute of limitations being permanent would be a permanent amnesty predating anything uh, before 1998. Is that correct, Louise? Depending on how it's framed. It's, at the moment, what we have on the table is... In terms of the uh, Defence Committee proposal, yeah, well, it was to put the line at 98, isn't that right? Uh, yes, roughly speaking. But it was a report that had a few lines in it. Mm. You know, it's not a fully thought through proposal. There is another inquiry now, but the report for that hasn't come out yet. There is also a private member's bill, which has been drafted, that also sets up an, uh, one model of what it could look like, and it's looking at roughly a 10-year limit. And some DUP MPs have put their name to that private member's bill, is that correct? Yes, it's a cross-party bill. So there are DEP names, there are Conservative names, I think there's one Labour Party um, MP as well. And, and how serious a prospect, how serious, although it's not in the consultation, mm -hmm. and I, I know we've got Chris mm -hmm. Flat here from the NIO, and we'll bring Chris into the conversation a little bit later. If I'm right, Chris, last November, so November 2017, the statute of limitations was to be part of the consultation and then was removed from the consultation document during the... Uh, negotiations which led to the draft agreement and separate arrangements in February this year is it, is it I, I, I just so that we can clarify this this point before I go back to Louise if that's okay uh, we'll, we'll get a mic here Chris of you so this is Chris Flatt who is the lead uh, NIO official on on legacy matters Broadly, where we had got to last year was, um, as you say, we had the, uh, uh, the report from the Defence Committee, and clearly it's an issue that's been discussed a lot in uh, the UK Parliament. So we were looking at that and considering whether the consultation was the right way to continue that discussion. Now, in the process of that being considered, um, it was clear that in Northern Ireland there was real opposition to the idea from uh, across the community, really. And I think based on the uh, the advice that the committee had received um, from um, indeed from some academics um, that might be here today, mm -hmm. um, that really for a statute of limitations to work. The advice was it needed to be across the board, and broadly it needed to support uh, peace and reconciliation, and that would be the basis on which it could be effective. Now, our view was that uh, given the strength of opposition to it in Northern Ireland, it would be difficult to see how you could say that it was supporting peace and reconciliation. Mm -hmm. So we took the view that in order for the consultation to run effectively, it would be better not to put forward uh, that proposal where we thought that we'd already seen um, significant opposition to it in Northern Ireland. But we were aware as well that there is a lot of uh, support for it, and that's why we had an open question in the consultation around this, which does allow people to put forward, uh, put forward this as an idea if they, uh, if they think it should be supported. But as I say, um, really for it to, uh, from, from the basis of the uh, academic evidence given to the committee for it to work, it has to be something that supports peace and reconciliation. And uh, I'm not sure if there's evidence that it would. Okay, Chris, we'll come back to you a little bit later. And thanks, thanks for that. So, so Louise, we, we, it, Chris, making very clear there is the open question in the consultation, mm -hmm. which means the the door hasn't hasn't been completely closed. Mm -hmm. Uh, on this uh, on this uh, suggestion that originated from the defence committee, so 
The latest Defence Committee report is looking at it not just in the Northern Ireland context, isn't that correct? Yes. Could you, could you explain that just a little bit to our audience so that they're across that? The Defence Committee has had a long-standing interest in investigations of uh, war crimes or allegations of war crimes committed by British soldiers in Iraq, mostly in relation to torture and deaths of, um, in detention of Iraqi um, detainees. Now, that was something that the International Criminal Court investigated so about a decade ago. And at that point, decided not, well, they launched a preliminary examination and they decided not to continue it. In more recent years, they've reopened that preliminary examination. And they're now at the third and final stage of that. So at some point soon, they should be deciding whether to launch a formal investigation into that. The Defence Committees had a long-standing interest in this. And... In response to the ICC investigations, the British government had tried to do some domestic investigations which had collapsed due to um, irregularities in the actions of one of the legal firms who brought some of the complaints against the armed forces. And so that has led to the Defence Committee trying to bring an end, I think, to a lot of the investigations into Iraq, uh, the, the, the crimes committed in Iraq. And so I think where the Defence Committee is looking at these issues, they're looking at it not just with Northern Ireland in mind. And I think drafting any such limitations that could cover both settings and potentially the actions of British soldiers elsewhere would be a very complicated issue. And I don't think they've fully thought it through. They haven't thought through the repercussions with what it would mean here in terms of the actions of non-state forces, for example. It seems to be a panic in terms of the penny dropping mm -hmm. uh, as to what historical investigations mm -hmm. might mean yeah. for soldiers and police officers. Is, is that a reasonable description of this current push for the statute of limitations, do you think? I wouldn't know the individuals involved to know whether they're panicking <laughs> yeah. as such, but yes, it does seem to be quite a sustained campaign among some, some sectors. I mean, whether it is a panicked response to these issues, whether it's part of a more general rejection among some sectors of international norms and human rights standards, it could be part of a number of different currents that could be motivating these demands, I think. Uh, Louise, we'll come back to you a little bit later just to talk about some sort of international learning, but mm -hmm. I want to bring George and uh, uh, Winston and Sean into the conversation now. And, and what we're, we're going to try to do in, in this part of this discussion is to try to answer that question that we set for the panel, will investigations and information retrieval bring us any closer to the truth of the conflict years? And before we get into the, the fine detail of that, George, uh, Winston and Sean are going to make some, some short opening comments. We'll then have a bit of a discussion with them, and then we're going to bring our audience into the conversation as well. Uh, Chief Constable George Hamilton. Thank you, Brian. Um, well, I've, I've been warned a number of times today that this is going to be hugely challenging, and I think it is, but I am here by invite, and it's an invite that I have the option to politely decline. I'm here because this is important. I'm here because... Uh, I'm glad to be here, even if there is going to be a challenge and even some uh, discomfort in our conversation, because conversations like this one and the background that we've been given by the previous speakers um, are really important. And if actually we're going to finish the job collectively of creating a better future, then we need to address this problem, this wicked problem of the past. And I know that the past echoes loudly across all of our society, but I do want to acknowledge that it rings louder and more painfully for uh, people who have lost loved ones, who have been injured psychologically or physically, and some of whom are in this room today. So that's important, I think, at the outset of my comments to just make that acknowledgement. And I want to say to everyone who has suffered um, as a result of our troubled past, but I can't take responsibility for everything that has happened in the past. I am a human being, and at a human level, I am sorry for your loss, for your pain, from whence ever it came. I'm conscious that my words too may echo hollow or shallow for some of you. It's three years since I was here before, sat at this table with Martin McGuinness discussing similar issues. And I know that there are people in this room today, 
and people listening to this who will feel that we're not much further forward. As a police officer, I've never seen it as my role to uh, prevent the truth from emerging. In fact, the opposite is true. As a police officer, as a chief constable, as a human being, I want the truth to emerge and I want it to be exposed. My role has always been to protect life, to secure justice, to uphold the law. First and foremost, I want the police service that I lead to be at the heart of your communities rather than be seen as some sort of remote arm of the state. That's not how I want this police service to be perceived. And I understand that families are frustrated, hurt, perhaps angry at the seemingly endless delays in their search for justice or even for answers um, and for a better understanding of what happened to their loved ones in, in the past. But those delays are not the result of any single individual or even any single organisation. They're the result of the existing current piecemeal and entirely inadequate quagmire that the processes that, were, that currently exist for dealing with the past or for not dealing with the past, actually. So in my role as Chief Constable, I feel like I'm in an impossible position. Not looking for your sympathy, but I have a right to say how I feel about these because I'm going to listen to you. I feel I'm in an impossible position caught between legal obligations on one hand financial constraints on the other, and if I had a third hand, it would be about public expectations. At times, I've had no option other than to appeal some court judgments. And I know that that has caused anger for some in this room today. I know that it has caused frustration for families who are still waiting for answers. However, I felt that I had no choice. The police service simply does not have the financial or the human resources to deal with some of these judgments as they currently stand. And on occasions, the judgments, I believe, are actually contradictory and unworkable. I need to be careful not to say any more about that because they are before uh, various courts of appeal. I said here in 2015, and I've said it many times since, that the current approach is not working for anybody. It's not working for me. It's not working for you, it's working for no one. And in the continuing political vacuum, witnesses and members of grieving families are passing away without resolution. This simply cannot be allowed to continue. And that is why this consultation is so important and the framework coming out of it needs to work to take us to a better place than we are now. Currently, it is unsatisfactory and unacceptable for all of us. So I'm glad to be here today uh, as part of this discussion. I have, since 2014, welcomed the Stormont House uh, Agreement and the elements of it that deal with these, this infrastructure for dealing with the past. We are considering the draft bill as an organisation and we will provide a detailed response. For us, there are some concerns in it, some issues in it, but actually all of this creates something that we can work with, especially if the consultation is meaningful. And given our experience of dealing with the past, we have concerns about setting, in particular, realistic timescales and resource allocation. Uh, but we very much want to make these proposals work and any of our commentary by the 10th of September will be towards that end. I've never been convinced that a criminal justice, uh, the criminal justice processes alone uh, can resolve this pain uh, and this toxic element of our post-conflict society. The cold reality is, is that with each day that passes, the chances of a criminal justice resolution in the majority of cases uh, increasingly reduces and becomes less likely. The consultation process gives us all the opportunity to help shape a set of proposals that will bring much needed change to how we deal with the past. I know that the conversations will be challenging and require all of us, the police included, me included, to move beyond our comfort zones. But we must strive for something better. What we have 
is inadequate and unacceptable in my opinion. And actually we owe it to all of those who have lost their lives from all quarters, to all of those, all of us who have suffered from all quarters, and we owe it in particular to our children and to current and future generations uh, of young people if we're going to uh, if we're going to do anything about making this society even better to help build that safe, confident and peaceful future. Thank you. Okay. Chief Constable, thank you. George, we'll just clear uh, one question up before uh, we go to uh, Sean. The Ulster Unionist Party has been saying recently that rather than an historical investigations unit, uh, more resources should be given to the PSNI and that historical investigation should remain with your legacy uh, unit. Now, I know Mike Nesbitt's here. Uh, I'll bring Mike into the conversation a little bit later uh, in the event. Uh, but for a, for a quick answer to that question, are you interested in additional resources that would allow the legacy matters to remain with the PSNI? Well, in the absence of these proposals coming to fruition through legislation and acceptance by all parties, that the PSNI is the only body of constables, to use that legal term, yeah. who are empowered to deal with it. Yeah. So uh, we have that in the back of our mind. We're not going to abandon our responsibilities under the law to investigate, that duty to investigate, but I don't think it is the best outcome. And I have every confidence, and I have some of the, the people here in the room today, I have every confidence in the professionalism, the integrity, the independence of our legacy investigators. But you know what? It doesn't really matter what I think. No, exactly. There are people in this room, out in this community across West Belfast and in other communities, loyalist, Republican, even police communities, who are questioning the independence of the police service of Northern Ireland to do this stuff. Now, I think legally and technically we can win arguments on that, but I think what the Historical Investigations Unit will do will just take away all of that difficulty and all of those question marks and a properly resourced, truly independent and truly accountable historical investigations unit is the model that I see likely to win the most success that will have our support and our full cooperation. So I think we can do it legally and technically and I will defend the integrity and independence of my organisation but I also want to acknowledge that that view is not shared by many people who have suffered and who are looking for answers. So I think this is the, the best opportunity that we're going to get to come up with a model that can be satisfactory or be less problematic at least for all who have lost loved ones and indeed who are suffering. I think I see the police ombudsman, Michael McGuire, Dr. McGuire, nodding in agreement there, but we'll, we'll maybe bring Michael into the conversation a little bit later. So our next speaker is uh, Sean Murray of Sinn Féin, uh, who has been uh, involved with his party in the, uh, the legacy negotiations up to this point. Sean Murray. Thank you, Can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, yeah lean forward. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's good to see such a big crowd here for this event. It's also good to see such a diverse group of people in the same room for such an organization. George referred to the fact that it's challenging. It's challenging for everyone. It will be challenging for Republicans. It will be challenging for lawyers. It will be challenging from, from the British state, its agencies and its former agencies, etc. But it has to be done, folks. This issue needs to be dealt with. There's been too many false cons in the past, too many times the hopes and aspirations of the victims and survivors community have been raised only to be dodged. And that's totally unacceptable. And I think everyone on this table in this room to share that fact. And it's also important to understand that this issue just doesn't impact on people who have lost loved ones or have loved ones seriously injured. This is a societal problem and needs to be seen in that context. Because every day you can hear the battle being fought on the airwaves in relation to the battle around the Argos. So what happened to our recent past? What happened in the conflict? Who's responsible for what? What were the genesis of the conflict? What sustained the conflict, etc. And that's not healthy. And that's where we need to develop mechanisms which everyone can buy into, or most people can buy into. I don't think we'll ever get to the stage where everyone will buy into it. 
And I'm seriously concerned at the present time about an attempt by a section of society to detach critical realism from the storm of entertainment magazines. I don't think that's a positive move. In fact, it's a regressive move. And something I think that uh, we need to have a focus on. So hopefully we can have a mature conversation about this issue. I said earlier, it's a societal problem. It needs to be dealt with society right across the board. I think that's important for this consultation because when I talk to groups of people, they've said, well, it doesn't really affect me because I think I've lost a loved one. If you're a member of this society, if you're trying to bring up a family in this society, then this issue needs to be dealt with. We're at the stage now, hopefully, of a consultation process as a precursor to a legislative process. And it's recognised the potential damage that this issue can do. It is causing tension, it has caused tension. It can divide, it can impact in a negative way on a relationship between the two main traditions on this end. They are out, as I referred to earlier, in the battle of narratives, especially around certain anniversaries which occur on a regular basis. It's been weaponized by a certain section to promote division, exclusion, and demoralization, which is in fact being the critical fabric of this society as well. It's undermined our attempts and society's attempts to develop levels of confidence in placing the criminal justice institutions. And that's something that we need to deal with as well. It also presents a barrier to developing a genuine process of healing from the conflict. There's a lot of pain out there, folks, a lot of suffering. Republicans have caused pain, lawyers have caused pain and suffering, and so have the state forces. Having said that they've also been on the receiving end of pain and suffering throughout the conflict. And it's a recognition that we don't want another generation to experience what my generation, I'm not going to know you're a bit younger, Joe. No, it's not an issue. When you've been the same age as me. No. Um, seriously, you know, that, that's, that's what drives me and drives many people um, in relation to dealing with this issue. Unless we deal with this, you can't try it. It's not going to go away. I'm just interested in reading there about the emergence of a truth commission for Spain. They tried to bury the issue for many years. You can't bury this issue, folks. They emerged on down the years. You know, when you talk to families, there was this concern. Family members were getting older. There may have been a tendency for some people to think uh, at a state level, well, sure, but they'll just die off. And the issue will be forgot about. The issue will not be forgot about. I've seen the button be handed over to the next generation um, and the objective of retrieving some measure of resolution, some measure of justice or information recovery. Because if you talk to families, there'll be different demands, different requirements um, in terms of what they want by way of uh, a trouble cost. So what we need to do is put a focus on the consultation. Hopefully, I'm going to hold you responsible, Chris, that the legislative process takes off as soon as possible. And what goes in at the start of the legislative process comes out in a similar fashion for the experience that there can be a differential between the two. And because you mentioned Barney, the concept or the issue of the statute of limitations, no doubt in my mind, there'd be an attempt at this much of time to search some sort of an amendment, etc. So for all the victims of survivors committee, it's important this issue is dealt with now. If we don't deal with it now, it could be another generation before there is a genuine attempt to deal with the issue, and that's totally unacceptable. So we want to create mechanisms, and I think Judith mentioned earlier, there was just been a, the broad architecture of the mechanisms that we're looking at now, it came through from Ian Bradley, in mm -hmm. name, of course. right through the Haas consulting process, I see Jerry Cavill sitting in the back, also Mike, many, many hours together, Mike, and discussing these issues through those processes, but it's been sort of a seamless transition for a, a justice action, Information recovery option. Of course. Um, the archive storytelling option, obviously, they're talking about services, but it's also issues that aren't on the agenda. And Judith made some kind of attention for those seriously injured, whether it's physical or psychological injuries. Now, an opportunity to address all the outstanding legacy issues. Let's not park some of them and just deal with others. We need to address all the issues now. You know, because some of these folk aren't getting any younger. Their needs, their needs are immediate. They don't have the wherewithal 
where we you know, have a, a passing because I haven't been able to work because of everything. Is. So these issues need a focus, need addressed, and this should be part of any process to deal with outstanding legacy issues. So hopefully we're at that stage now. We can have that mature discussion. But there are the key principles that need to be adhered to. Independence, inclusion, they're the key concepts. If we try to exclude any section of the community, if it isn't perceived to be independent, you're not going to have buy-in. And if you don't have buy-in for any of these mechanisms, they are not going to work. Okay, Sean, thank you. Sean Murray. <laughs> Uh, I read a tweet before I came to this event uh, asking why these two men were being given a platform. And uh, I think if we're to be real, and, uh, I, didn't, I don't think it was George and me that we were talking about. <laughs> I certainly don't think that. Uh, but, uh, but if we're going to be real and if we're going to be serious about this process, it needs the involvement of Republicans and Loyalists. And it needs leadership within those communities to deliver people into that legacy process. That's why we have people on these platforms. So our next speaker is uh, Winston Irvine uh, from the Loyalist community. And uh, Winston, the mic's yours, if Sean will give you. Yeah. So, uh, I suppose, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Fela on the 30th anniversary um, of their festival. And also to uh, thank them for the opportunity and the invite and for creating the space uh, for a, a very important discussion on what cannot be underestimated in terms of its significance. How we deal with the past, in my view, is a major issue uh, still outstanding in terms of the unfinished work of our peace process. It is, in my view, uh, an issue that goes well beyond uh, any government of the day. It's an issue that goes well beyond even all of us in this room, given the significant impact, the conflict and the horrors of it have had in this society uh, as a whole. If we are to deal with the past in a way that transcends traditional uh, divisive and antagonistic uh, divisions, then we need to set our thinking on the future, on what kind of a future we want not only for ourselves but for future, future generations to come. We also need to uh, set our ideas on issues that deliver victims uh, the resolution to the highest level of possibility. And I want to say from the outset that uh, as a loyalist and as someone who uh, is familiar with conflict, uh, someone who is familiar with growing up in the community in which conflict was inflicted upon and which a community uh, inflicted and afflicted on others, that I absolutely recognize uh, the hurt and pain and suffering, uh, which is intolerable, and no words of mine will, will console those uh, who have been bereaved or their families that have been left behind. However, it is important uh, to acknowledge that, uh, and it's also important uh, to say that I don't think we have an option not to deal with this issue. The consequences of not dealing with this issue means that we will keep the burden and the poison that we have all had to experience, live with and grapple through on the next generation. So therefore I think there's a moral imperative, a political imperative and also a social imperative to ensure that we design mechanisms that not only deliver the maximum resolution for victims, but also and equally important for the good of society as a whole. I want to see the veil lifted on what went on in this place. That has to be welcomed. But what I don't want to engage in, and which I think we should avoid at all costs, 
is to engage and entrain narratives on who inflicted the most and who suffered the most. I think that reinforces difference, reinforces division, and takes us down blind alleys. I would also say that I don't believe there are any political parties suitably qualified with driving a legacy process, or for that matter, a reconciliation process, given that to a lesser or greater degree, whether by omission or commission, they were complicit or implicit in what went on here. So I would agree that we do need outside help. I do think it needs to be independent. I recognise that the, one of the principles that the Victims Commissioner uh, mentioned, which I thought, thought was uh, very interesting, uh, was this issue of uh, co-design. Uh, as a loyalist, I think there is a design fault uh, thus far. <coughs> Loyalists have not had a voice at the table, however you judge it. They are and were a main protagonist. And quite frankly, uh, those who have the power and the responsibility need to take account of that gap and that design flaw. Without loyalists involved in this process, without loyalists having a trusted voice who can represent and reflect the views, concerns and fears and possibilities, in my view, any legacy process will be limited, if not unworkable. I want to finish um, by saying that the conversation um, today uh, represents for me probably one of the most inclusive uh, conversations on this issue uh, to date. We have a whole range of people in this room, governance, media, uh, activists from a Republican background, from a loyalist background, police, those who have no involvement, academia, a fairly decent representation of our community. And I think uh, there is some lesson for those policy makers in relation to uh, engaging in uh, processes that can uh, command a way to support. Because without uh, a broad command of support and buy-in, uh, I think we will revisit this issue over and over. Thank you. Winston, thank you very much. <laughs> I think very significant that you mentioned our community, meaning our communities in the widest sense, you know, and that was one of the things Martin McGuinness spoke about when he was here with uh, George and I uh, three years ago, that we get beyond talking about the communities to talk about, uh, about the community. I just want to explore with George and Sean and Winston some of the uh, specifics of what's on the table. So Winston, when, when, when you say without a, a loyalist voice uh, th this process will be limited and unworkable, you've made it clear, as have other loyalists, I see Tom Roberts and, and William Mitchell in our audience today, you've made it clear that if this process is to be investigation working alongside uh, information retrieval, uh, that it is unlikely that there would be loyalist involvement. Is that correct? Well, I think if you're, if you're talking about getting, in many ways, uh, an investigation process that looks to facilitate uh, judicial prosecutions of loyalists, of Republicans, state and non-state actors, people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, or, or whatever, then I do think that um, will interfere with the levels of participation in terms of an information recovery process. I don't think you will get or see queues of loyalists uh, at the door of the ICIR uh, if there's any risk uh, of a potential bleed uh, into the prospect of, of judicial uh, prosecutions. I fully understand uh, the uh, notion about uh, the delivery of justice through uh, criminal justice outcomes. <coughs> However, w when you think about it, uh, you know, HET covered somewhere in the region of about 1,800, 1850 cases, with roughly about 
three prosecutions successfully prosecuted. The reality is, the cold brutal reality is that there will be very few prosecutions which will lead to people uh, going back to prison. I don't believe that we should be sending people uh, back to prison uh, as a way to uh, address the past. And that's not the same as saying, and I want to say this very, very yes. clearly, that there shouldn't be investigations. But we can, I think we can do investigations without it amounting to a duty to prosecute. And I think the mechanisms uh, at the moment uh, don't necessarily make that uh, very clear. And this is the point that Leo Green made in, co in conversation with yourself and Louise uh, some time ago. Uh, when he said that uh, no Republicans, no loyalists, no police officers, no soldiers, no people from the intelligence community should be going to jail, but that there should be those investigations of all of the information that is there leading to the maximum amount of information being made available to, to families. That, that's the point you're making, that if you have investigation, uh, then it is unlikely that you're going to have uh, the required participation uh, in information retrieval processes. That, that's, that's correct. That's precisely it. Uh, Sean, we, uh, we, we talked a little bit earlier about the, uh, the processes that have worked, um, decommissioning that, that disappeared, uh, where there was an IRA uh, interlocutor with uh, General de Chastelin and with the, uh, the disappeared commission. Will there be uh, an IRA interlocutor uh, working in conjunction with the ICIR if it comes into place? There will be a Republican interlocutor, as you're well aware. The IRA met the stage 2005, so it can't be an IRA locator. And that has been worked well with the uh, ICLDR. And just make reference to a report. It's by a colleague of yours, Lauren Dancer from Queen's. He's done a, a presentation up in the assembly. And she just opposed the, the precedent that had been created with that body and the similarities between that and the concept of the ICIR. I think it's significant that eliminating the time to uh, outlines. So both bodies will be established uh, in legislation, both in Britain and in the Irish jurisdiction. In fact, the ICIR is the international treaty. To be independent of the justice system, they'll be enabled to disclose information related to whether law enforcement or intelligence agencies. The information will be inadmissible in court proceedings, that's all court proceedings, civil, criminal, and inquests. The identities of those who provide the information will not be disclosed. The provision of information to the ICR does not render an individual immune from prosecution. But there is a limited immunity to the information. Of course, I understand. Coming forward and settling. Because Winston, you raised the point about concerns around prosecutions. Judith, I think, made the very obvious point. What are we trying to develop? Is it a victim center? Is it a victim within a process of the trying to develop? And if that is the case, then we just can't take that service. That we have to listen to the victims. Just before the onset of the Haas process, myself and Jerry Kelly and Jennifer McConnell and Gates were carrying out a very extensive um, engagement process with a lot of the victims' groups and families, etc. And the one resounding message that we were getting is please don't close down our absence. At that stage, you wanted a truth commission rather than that, that, the, the Stormont House Agreement process. Is that correct? Yes. At, at, at the uh, onset of the Ian Bradley's, our, our submission was about an independent international truth commission. Um, British government would not contain any international dimension to these mechanisms because they want the control of the mechanisms. So any attempt to introduce an international dimension, um, just like Frank Stiles and no acceptance whatsoever because control was the issue for the government, especially when it came to disclosure, etc. So we had to attempt during those negotiations, and this was a series of negotiations, how do you build in sort of guarantees and legislation which will protect the identity and the information of course. and the sources of the information. Yes. And there was a precedent forward in terms of this far body. Yes. Fact, the legislation case the yeah. Now, yeah. But there is a concern about the ICIR now, and we'll, oh. we'll, we'll come back to that in a moment, Sean. But um, So you, you say there will be, and I, I'm just, I, I, I think people need to understand how, how cooperation with these processes will, will, will work if they come into place. So you say there will be a Republican interlocutor, not an IRA interlocutor, because the IRA have left the stage. George, you say there is still an IRA structure. So would a Republican interlocutor in effect be 
an IRA interlocutor to the ICIR? I think it's irrelevant. Um, the needs to be mechanisms to get the information from the individuals and groups or former groups, if that's how they wish to be described, into the process so that uh, victims get the answers that they need. And the um, arguments that the likes of Sean and other Republicans and I uh, will not agree on is what structures still exist and if so, what relevance is it? And but you believe a structure still exists? That's well, uh, yeah. what I don't want to do is detract from no, what no. could be a very meaningful debate yeah. and the arguments that we've had for okay. the last three years about what exists and what okay. exists to do and all the rest of it. Okay. For me, it's pretty much irrelevant. There is no threat coming from anything that was the provision of IRA in the past and if any remnants of it still exist, it doesn't create any national security threat in my assessment. Okay, so if there is an ICIR, will there be a PSNI um, stroke RUC interlocutor to the ICIR? Well, is that the way it works? Well, I mean, my my, my reading of the, the, the bill and, and the consultation documents is that all parties would be requested to cooperate with that. Yeah. And actually, we are working through and want to make sure that we feed back into the governments the implications of that yeah. because the uh, IRA in its various forms and indeed loyalist paramilitaries weren't that hot on record keeping. Their record management system was maybe not what ours would have been. Well, you say that, George, so but I can remember, and uh, let, let, let me just uh, on this point, uh, and Damon Malley is with us. I can remember in 1993, uh, when the story emerged of the uh, secret government contact with the Republican leadership and Patrick Mayhew published a written record, that uh, Republicans produced a written record within a matter of days, which led to Patrick Mayhew having to admit to 20 or 30 errors in the British record. So the idea that there's no record out there uh, or that there's no corporate memory out there, George, I mean, probably doesn't stack up. No, I wasn't suggesting that there wasn't any corporate memory. I think there is the knowledge and the memory within, right, right across the various sectors and groups that were involved in the troubles or the conflict, depending on how you want to describe it, that would help victims to get answers to their questions. Mm. That, that exists. What I'm saying is, and I'm sure the audience will touch upon this when we get <coughs> to that yep. stage, but we have a massive vault a vault of disclosure that is creating problems and bad feeling and anger and frustration through the current processes and the ICIR which we are, are supportive of the concept and we want it to work but we want everybody including the governments to go into it that goes back to my earlier comments about this thing being properly resourced mm. I've got in around 100 people working every day lawyers and police officers on disclosure onto the current uh, chaos that we're in, mm -hmm. servicing everything from the courts, the inquest, the ombudsman, and other interested people who have a, a locus around this, and the ICR is going to be another major source of demand for that. That's not a reason not to do it, it just means that those framing the legislation and those responsible for resourcing, i.e. the governments, understand what they're going into. But, but, uh, but, but in terms of what the ICR is trying to achieve, yes. but we have an outcome. Yes. We're supportive of it. Yes. We will cooperate with it. But you know, So you it, will build a link to the ICIR? Is, is, uh, you will have an interlocutor or whatever whatever well, it, you may want to call I, it? I think, I think it's probably going to be much more complex than an individual. It'll need to be a system. It'll need to be supported by IT. Yeah. I mean, the scale of what we're dealing with in the intelligence world alone, I don't mm. I'd love to throw it all out there. Mm. <laughs> Uh, the law prevents me from doing that, and I'm sure we come to that in our of discussion. Course, of course. But we reckon there's about 45 million pieces of paper. There are three legacy IT systems that don't talk to each other, that are not entirely searchable, that the knowledge of even how to use them is disappearing as people leave the organisation. We are sitting on mountains of material, mm. all of which needs to go through. So uh, what, what I'm saying is that I support the outcome that an ICR is trying to achieve. Mm. We want to engage with it, mm. but actually the resourcing of all the, ma the machinery and the mechanics in the background to be able to do that without creating more hurt, frustration and anger is a political decision and it's going to have to be properly resourced. But that's, that's not my call, but yeah. what I'm saying is supportive of the process, 
whatever you want to call the link in, mm. we will do all of that. Yes. But we acknowledge more so than the other groups that were part of the conflict that we're sitting on material. We're not going to shred it. We're going to keep it. We're going to act in good faith. But it is a monster. Yes. But and but if we get to the point of this process, the HIU you will have the vault. Is that correct? No, Rather than, no, no. That, that, no. That, I mean that, that would be my heart's desire. Yes, right. <laughs> so that's that's not the case then. So, that so explain that, will you? Because, yeah, because uh, the, this metaphor that I think you actually coined it and then blamed it on me. But More I, fake it, news. It's, it's More fake a, news. It's, it's, not a, <laughs> it's not a bad metaphor. Uh, let's call it the the, the vault the for okay. one of the okay. metaphor. Yes. But what I would like to do with that is to just simply hand it and or the keys over to the director of the HIU. Okay. But under the, the legislation that governs the retention of personal records and all the rest of it, and this isn't even just around the national security argument, set all that aside for a minute. Yes. Um, then people who are the data owners have certain responsibilities. Okay. I'm going to need to access that because these provisions that have been set up are basically looking at the investigation of deaths and some other yes. crimes that might touch upon where of a course. death has occurred, but it's largely about the investigation of the deaths. We're going to have to retain responsibility for the investigation of other things. These provisions do not cater for um, the a, com a complete handover of the... Uh, the no, it, 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 it technically and legally can't happen. The same with the inquest. So you disclose all, all, to all the HIU rather than give them the vault. No, is that correct? What, what we will be proposing um, is that this gets sharpened up in the legislation so that the director of the HIU can basically have co-ownership of all of this material so that they're not seeking my permission, but they have got full access and with that comes whatever responsibilities the legislators want to give them. So at okay. the moment, whilst I would like to throw more material out there, unredacted than I can, I have in law responsibilities okay. to apply some restrictions to that material. I want that, along with the flack, frankly, that comes my direction from people who are frustrated, hurt and angry, yeah. to go towards the director of the HIU. Okay, so it's a co-ownership of the that, that, That's, that's, that's what, what you that's want. What our, that's what okay. we want. In this. Okay, uh, Winston, um, in terms of, uh, and, and, and I understand that you've got, uh, you've got concerns, but, but if we get to the point where you, you have an ICIR that, that loyalists uh, could cooperate with, uh, will the UVF or that, that arm of loyalism have an interlocutor to the ICIR? Uh, you need to move that mic around, Winston. In my view, or I think uh, loyalists will participate in formal legacy structures, provided that their views and concerns have been properly taken account of. Now, having said that, I also think that loyalists will participate in processes to uh, recover information and to get the maximum level of information for families and survivors and their families, provided that all other sides are going to be open, transparent, genuine and honourable in their endeavours. All other sides? All other sides. Okay. I think in that circumstance, Loyalists will, will stand ready uh, to fully participate. In fact, uh, there is precedent for Loyalists to uh, participate in uh, this area of work. You know, we have to look at the Eames Bradley uh, Consultative Forum. Uh, there was a, a very intensive engagement, as I understand, from the leaderships acro across the Loyalist groups uh, in relation to that, uh, that piece of work. Uh, the CLMC statement of 1994. Uh, also acknowledged uh, the importance of recognising and acknowledging um, the impact of truth recovery and the impact the conflict has had on people. So uh, I think if the circumstances are right, uh, lawyers will engage uh, in formal structures. Okay. Uh, and Sean, just before we go to the audience, um, an issue has uh, emerged in recent times about just how protected information to the ICIR uh, will or will not be. Uh, in fact, uh, and, and I know you say that you're addressing this in problem-solving mode, uh, but you, you did say that that, uh, that revelation recently, that, that some of this information um, uh, could become an investigative lead for investigators, uh, had the potential to critically damage, I think you said, the, the, this aspect of this, uh, of this process. Well, I think the leads 
Sorry, Louise brought it to our attention at a seminar Queen. Louise, you remember, it wasn't long after the uh, consultation was launched, mm -hmm. whereby we found a, a provision within the explanatory notes. Um, I said with Ken, and she's Chris O'Brien, it in the explanatory notes because it was never discussed during the negotiations. We spent a massive amount of time looking at the legislative protections uh, for the allow information to fall to protect the identity and the information flow itself. Because we recognise, I think everyone recognises, unless you do that, no meaningful information is going to come forward. Yeah. So those guarantees have to be there. And it's similar to what the document are referred to earlier says, we must develop that concept of trust. Yes. The people who bring forward the information must trust in that institution or that concept. Uh, and that puts a heavy responsibility on the people working that institution. They need to develop that working relationship mm -hmm. with the people who they'll be engaging with. Yes. But it's not there in legislation. Yes. Um, you're not going to convince anyone to bring forward that information. So once we heard about this explanatory note, and basically about, I can make reference to it, Bonnie. Yes. What it referred to was policing authorities or a coroner would not be prevented from pursuing lines of inquiry based on information disclosed by the commission and a report to a family. Part of the problem would be that these would be done concurrently. You'd have investigations happen mm -hmm. at the same time as a, an information recovery process. Mm. Right? If this led to the evidence being generated or fresh information, then that new evidence would not fall under the inadmissibility provisions in the legislation. So here was a major issue which could then massively confidence uh, and maybe prevent, uh, present a new barrier to bring yes. people bringing forward that information. So it needs to be dealt with, it needs to be dealt with urgently. We've been engaging with Chris in relation to it. We've sent Chris some documentation. Every visit being Bradley um, report, because they must have recognized the potential for this conflict uh, of interest in relation to the issue, where they talked about sequencing um, these uh, mechanisms that the investigation will go first. Mm -hmm. Once they're completed, not closed, because they differentiate between a completed report and a closed report, then the information recovery mechanism could kick in. We also talked about the concept of protected statements mm -hmm. and that the information or anything derived from the information could not be used. Of course. Uh, yeah. uh, prosecutorial yeah. um, case, etc. There are other proposals that I've heard. I think we need to have a focus on all those proposals, but they need to be sort of examined and sort of dealt with as soon as possible. Because the danger is once you create that lack of confidence, if there's a time lag with that, it's very difficult to rebuild that. Of course, of, of course. You spend so much time on it, trying to safeguard mm. and reassure people that if information does come forward, that information, the identity of the people involved, and yes. the identity of anyone who the information would be protected. Yeah. And I know, Winston, uh, that loyalists, uh, for, for loyalists, this, confir uh, this confirmed concerns about engagement in that process. And we'll, we'll talk to you a little bit about that later. But, George, you said you wanted to say something on this issue. Is that right? No, it's just a, it's a comment. The, the, the surprising footnote that Sean and his colleagues found, uh, not of us, by the way, Sean, but, um, <laughs> but that pretty much describes how the material coming out of the Bloody Sunday inquiry could be used. So... We ended up, as a police service, conducting criminal justice murder investigations, frankly, <coughs> into uh, a number of actors, predominantly British soldiers, but also some uh, Republican activists as well, um, the, into a bloody Sunday investigation. Those files are currently with the, the prosecutor. But, yes, of course. But most of those leads came from the Bloody Sunday Inquiry itself. Okay. So we couldn't use the material, we couldn't use the testimony yes. um, as evidence to present to the prosecutor, but we were able to... Were you identified take, investigative we, leads, you we, could use it, is we, that right? We could take from that, there's a line of inquiry to pursue, we need to go and see if we can translate that into evidence and present to the prosecutor. Okay. So, uh, now, I'm not necessarily advocating for that model, but yes. what it, I'm, I'm just simply saying... There's precedent. There's precedent there, um, uh, Bloody Sunday public inquiry clearly is not an ICIR, but there are yep. parallels. And and I think it would be important if political consensus is essential in this, it would seem to me that everybody knows what they're signing up to. Of course. So if, 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 if the politicians don't want 
that implication that fell out of the bloody Sunday very where we ended up yep. with a huge uh, homicide investigation. Yeah. Um, they need to close that gap. They now. need to close that gap. Either okay. that or intentionally leave it open and resource appropriately to deal with it. Okay. Okay. So we're going to go out into our audience, and we've also got uh, quite a media representation here. And uh, given their tea time deadlines, um, I'm going to allow some some questions from the media as well to the panel. Uh, Tracy's here from UTV. Vincent from BBC. Rebecca's here. Uh, I see John Ware here, and John Ware is here making a documentary. Uh, on the on the Birmingham bomb, so there, there will be time for those questions as well as time for questions from the audience. And then I want to come back to Louise as well to talk a little bit about about international learning. So who who would like to to open from the floor? Okay. And if you would just identify yourself. If, if you... Hi, uh, my name is John. Mm -hmm. uh, I've lived in the Middle East for about six seven years in Jerusalem. Okay, John. And the pound tell me what is a victim? Okay. Judith, would you like to take that one as victims yes. commissioner? Absolutely. Yeah, can I can I pop that over to you? Yeah. We have a legal definition here that the commission operates under of who is a victim. And that says that anybody who is injured, anybody who's bereaved, anybody who's traumatized, anybody who's a carer. It specifically includes first responders, so police officers, medics, and others first on the scene who deal with traumatic things as well. So it's a very inclusive definition. You okay, John? Yeah, yeah. Next, okay, yeah. Uh, uh, can, can you just wait for the microphone there, please? Yeah. Your name is? Frank. Mike, hi, Mike. Frank. Frank, Frank. Frank. sorry, Frank, yeah. Okay, yeah. Uh, I, I just wanted to uh, ask the panel a, a broader question, and that is, um, we know the whys and the why nots, as to, and everybody seems to be convinced and convincing that it should happen. What are the fears that either the process or indeed the framework yeah. doesn't produce it? Okay, so we'll, we'll let Winston take that one to start with, because he's talked about a design flaw within the process, which obviously needs to be addressed. Uh, to, to, to bring on board uh, loyalist participation. Well, I think, Frank, uh, your, your question and your point um, goes right to the very heart um, of the significance of, of this discussion. Um, there are leaderships and leaders of both loyalist and Republicans um, who are, quite frankly, not getting any younger, who have the capacity to uh, bring forward and to help facilitate uh, information and to help lift the veil uh, on the truth of what happened here in relation to those who uh, bear the responsibility for the people that they've aggrieved. Uh, those people, uh, I think, however you judge them, uh, need to be um, brought into a mechanism that allows uh, for the maximum amount of resolution uh, to be given to victims. The absence of that will mean that that information, the truth to victims and their families, will be lost forever. It will also mean that uh, the issue which, in my view, uh, the deal uh, of the past in this place uh, is much larger than any single person. It goes way beyond uh, ourselves. Uh, it requires us to give of ourselves in a way that uh, assists and helps people um, to try to come to terms uh, in a much better way uh, than what they have been able to previously. So to not deal with this issue at this particular time, I think, risks uh, the loss of an opportunity to actually get to the truth of what happened. And you're not for one minute suggesting we dump the process. It's it's refine it, rework parts of it. Is that is that? I, I think there. Are, I mean, there's a consultation process uh, in place uh, for good reason. Uh, there's clearly uh, not political agreement around the Storm Crisis Agreement, um, which is a bit of a contradiction in its terms. Um, there are obviously uh, gaps uh, in terms of the protagonists. 
who I think need to be involved if we want to have an inclusive process. So yes, there needs to be, um, in my view, fundamental changes uh, to the systems and to the institutions that are proposed in the current proposal. Uh, Mike, can I... Can I just ask uh, for a comment from you? You, you? you said at the weekend, you called at the weekend for the DUP, I think, to withdraw support for the, for the, for the HIU, for the Historical Investigations Unit. Uh, you, you were party leader at the time of the Stormont House Agreement. Uh, did you sign up to that agreement or did you not sign up to it? We did not sign up to it. Um, did you reject it? We said at one point, I think, that we would give it a fair win, but we, we never signed up to it, Brian. What, what I would like to say is, first of all, I don't believe that the way we do things at the moment uh, is, is tenable. It's, it's imperfect and it's incomplete, so we do need to change. My difficulty with the HIU is that it's not some of ACT, it's not a review, it's a proper police investigation, mm. and yet it's only available to less than half of the deaths and none of the injured. So when Judith says her test is, is it victim-led and is it victim-centered? For me, it fails the test because it excludes so many victims. The NIO's own test, I think they have five things. It has to be balanced, proportionate, transparent, fair, and equitable. There's nothing fair and equitable about excluding 47,000 victims from the only new mechanism which holds out any prospect of receiving justice. Politically, and the point has been made, the, the legacy has become politicised, and I regret that. For example, when I was leading the party, I regretted the fact that we were operating on the principle of nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, because all the parties agree, for example, one of the most toxic legacies is poor mental health and well-being, not just of individuals, but of families and communities. And I accept that sometimes that poor mental health is directly because of the lack of justice. But we could have moved forward with certain measures to try and improve the well-being of communities, but we didn't because nothing is agreed until everything is agreed. And the other point I would like to make, Brian, is that when I was leading, I wanted everybody to make acknowledgement statements at the beginning of the process. And what I mean by that is, it's what Sean said, Republicans hurt people, loyalists hurt people, the Austria Unionist Party hurt people. You cannot govern for five years without hurting people. We govern for 51 years. And I would have liked to have made that acknowledge acknowledgement statement along with the other leaders at the start of the process so that we're saying this is not about pointing the finger of blame. Mm. This is about accepting there is a mess. None of us has clean hands. And the important thing is collectively we are committed to putting it right. So acknowledgement first rather than later in the process is your point? Right at the start. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Emma, is that, is that, I just, uh, Emma has her hand raised here in row two. Thank you. Thanks for question for the Chief Constable. Yeah. Um, my family were buried in 1994 and my dad was murdered in, in Lock and Island. And we started on our own um, truth recovery and dealing with the past ourselves. And um, in 2016, Dr. McGuire had um, released a report into the atrocity in Lockett Island, and that he was the first person ever, um, an authority of the state, to give us truth into what happened and what went wrong with the police investigation into the murders. I want to know, can you confirm today publicly that you accept his statutory role as the police ombudsman and the, the entirety of his findings in our case? Because, as people know, the retired police officers have taken a spiteful and a malice approach to having our case heard again in court and under judicial review. And that just adds insult to injury, insult to the wound, and re-traumatizes families. And not only now, but that is because of this case and the retired police officers, and I publicly know that that is not something that, that you or the PSNI have any control over, but it's holding up. The, the cases for other victims, as in the on the road Bricky's case, Gracie's, and hundreds of other family members. I myself, my grandfather died before we got that report in 2016 at 92. People are dying b before they get the truth, and that's not acceptable. Okay, Emma, thanks. George? Well, Emma, I, I started off my remarks by acknowledging the loss and the hurt in the room, and to you specifically, and especially to the loss of your grandfather with unanswered questions then uh, 
at a human level that is just horrible and uh, I pass on my sympathy around all of them. The victims, the families of Logan Island have not had from the police service the uh, quality of investigation they should have had. When Dr. McGuire published his report in June 16, I said that I accepted it. I did not think in law or in practice it was my place to question that. What I did have, and I still have some questions, there were some very serious findings made by the Ombudsman in that June 16 report um, that led me to ask some questions as an investigator. And I think that it's right and valid that I should do that. Now, I do need to be careful here because whether you and I like it or not, the retired police officers have their proceedings on a court in court and all the rest of it, and this is a public meeting. But uh, when we were getting to the strength of the observations and the findings from Michael and his investigative team, uh, what concerned me was that these people did not end up in a custody suite, being interviewed under caution, or being arrested. And all of us as investigators have the frustrations where we know what has happened, but we can't prove it to a certain level to satisfy a prosecutor to take it into court. But actually there are various thresholds of uh, liability or suspicion that is required. So the first one is, is just to ask somebody to account for their actions under a criminal caution. That's when people are told you're not obliged to say anything unless you wish to do so and all of that. Um, and they're told that what you're about to say will be on the record and even if you say nothing, an inference could be drawn from that. All you need for there is a reasonable suspicion that somebody has committed an offence. Now, the concern that I had with the Ombudsman's report, I'm not questioning any of the findings. I don't think it's up to me. It's they who have done the investigation and I have no remit in law, and it would undermine confidence in the process for me to question any of that. So I accept their investigation and their findings. The unanswered questions that I have still are, why was nobody interviewed after caution, even that very basic low threshold level of suspicion required to take some sort of action? Uh, no one was arrested. Now, you know, there's... Uh, proportionality and necessity criteria applied to arrest is not always necessary to arrest someone to get an account from them under a criminal caution. But why was no one charged? And that again comes down to how what the strength of evidence is against them. And what I had, what I read in that report as an investigator or someone who was once a competent investigator, hopefully I don't get to do that stuff too much now, but it was very serious findings that I'm not questioning. Um, about you know collusion leading to the death of people in Lockan Island and all the rest of it. If that's the case, why are these people not going through due process? It's not my position to do that. That is the police ombudsman's role. So I say this with Michael in the room. We have had the conversation privately. Uh, he will have an explanation that he can offer around that. But for me, if an investigator, not a judge now, this is the difference. <laughs> if an investigator is coming to a conclusion that was so definitive in relation to the police misconduct or even potential criminality, why was nobody interviewed under the Police and Criminal Evidence Order and had the benefit of a criminal caution? That's what I think they were entitled to, and actually I think that's what, how they should have been held to account. That has not happened, and for me that's a big unanswered question. There's a whole other thing about what collusion means before the court. That's the subject of the judicial review. I have said as much publicly as I can at events at Queen's and other places about that. Um, you know, I, I think it's an ill-defined term legally, but I don't believe really the legal quagmire whilst it is at hearing or certainly before the uh, Court of Appeal. But that's, that's my observation. I'm not questioning it. I feel awful yep. about your loss. I feel embarrassed by the shortcomings in the initial police investigations. So my place to question the Ombudsman's findings, but I do have very valid questions about so what and now what Ombudsman, if this is the conclusions that you're coming to, why is nobody arrested, charged or even interviewed after caution? You're not questioning, but you have many questions. Michael, would you like to respond? Um, uh, I've seen some people, I think Barra is to our right, so we'll take Michael, then we're going to take 
Barra, it was you, Barra, who, yeah, yeah, Barra, I'm going to take uh, Dr. William Mitchell, I'm going to take Daniel Holder, and I'm going to take Stan, who have had their names up, and then we'll see what time we have uh, after that. So, uh, Dr. Michael McGuire, the police ombudsman. Uh, thanks, Bonnie. Well, Jordan and Brian, we have had this, this conversation, and we're both constrained by the legal proceedings that are ongoing uh, in relation to the judicial review, and we're expecting judgment in September in relation to that. I think there's a number of things that would respond. I mean, George very clearly identifies coercion as a criminal conspiracy. I mean, he has a definition of the law of coercion, which I didn't share in the context of the report. I used the Semitic definition, which I have to say some people regarded as an appropriate definition when it came to collusion between the IRA and the guards, and it was sufficiently meaningful and broad to examine the nature of that relationship, but don't find it acceptable in the context of using it in relation to Northern Ireland with regard to the police and wellness permits. So I was very clear and, and very clear in the report in terms of what my understanding of collusion was, how the issues around the arms importation, the nature of the arms importation, the nature of the events that went up to Rockland Island, what happened in relation to that, and the proceedings following the, the actual murder itself. So therefore I was entirely content with the, the nature of the conclusion that we came to. And for me, and I talked about it earlier on today, I mean, part of the, 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 the challenge moving forward is that there's a dissonance, there's a disconnect between an objective which is, wants to be one which is about reconciliation, but is pursuing a path which, because of the structures, that will perhaps make matters worse. And what, by the, what, what I mean by that is the, the HIU, which I firmly support because there's no alternative, is kicking the can further down the road in relation to addressing some of these very difficult, and to, to use your phrase, sort of wicked issues. And one of those things we have to do is to address, in the context of collusion, what we actually mean by that. Because the extremes of, it didn't happen, and there's a lie, I'm afraid it just doesn't stand up to all of the evidence, not necessarily by my office, but all of the evidence that's been repeated. I think, secondly, a definition of collusion which sees it everywhere, which sees it pervasive of all aspects of policing, is also simply wrong. And therefore, if we want to engage with um, proper discourse, excuse me, proper discourse around these issues, then I do think addressing the complex issue of collusion is something that we need to do, whether we use the term at all, whether we find it meaningful. But in the context of my report, the Semitic definition that I used, and the evidence that I put in the report, and indeed the evidence that I saw that I didn't put in the report, for me, I'm entirely comfortable with the, the conclusions that I came to. But in relation to the uh, the broader proceedings, uh, that, that's probably all we said. Okay. Um, Raymond, uh, I, I see you're with us. W would you want to make any comment on this at all? I, I, I just think, given what has been said about the retired police officers, uh, with, you, with you present, we should at least give you the chance to, to reply. Well, I, I've heard what the Chief Constable has said, and I've heard what the Police Ombudsman has said. Uh, I don't think it's a proper uh, issue for discussion, unfortunately, because we are all constrained. The matter is still uh, uh, sub judice, uh, and I think we should wait for that. Uh, I will take issue with what Mr. McGuire said. I don't accept with what's in his report. I think he does a massive injustice to Judge Smithick. Judge Smithick actually applied due process uh, to what he did before he arrived with the issue of collusion. Uh, Judge McCluskey let it out quite clear in his judgment where the police ombudsman went seriously wrong in what he was applying. But I don't think that's an issue uh, that's there. I would find serious problems with some of the findings that are contained in the report. Uh, like the Chief Constable, I would offer my sympathy entirely to all the victims of the Lock and Island atrocity. Uh, it should never have happened. It was carried out by, as it were, a loyalist parliamentary organisation. Uh, but I would dispute the fact that there was any collusion between the police and those that were responsible for that. Uh, Mr. McGuire had the opportunity to investigate that matter. He wrote to the former director of public prosecutions in September of 2015, and he told them that he had conducted both a criminal investigation, not into one 
uh, matter, but into the two matters, the arms importation and the Lachlan Island. And he also told them in the same report that there was no misconduct. So there was neither criminal activity on the part of any police officer, nor was there any misconduct. Now, I didn't read that when I read the Lachlan Island report. I think it's a, a, a glaring omission that should have been there for everybody to read. The former director of public prosecutions, I think, was here, still is here. He is, yeah. Uh, he got that report and he agreed with the Mr. McGuire that, in fact, there was no criminal evidence of any conduct by any police officer relative to Lachlan Island, and he had not the privilege of seeing any misconduct report because no misconduct report was prepared. So, you know, there are major issues over Lachlan Island. Uh, they are subdued to say at the moment, and I would be reluctant to say anything more on that. We'll leave it where, with what you've said. So, Barra, Barra McGrory, then Dr. William Mitchell, uh, John, we'll come to you in a moment. Uh, Stan, and then I'm going to take some uh, some media questions, and then I'm going to let the panel uh, have a final thought, in, including something from Louise on on what we can learn from international experience. So, Barra McGorry. Thank you, Barney. For reasons which have been well stated, I obviously am not going to say anything about the case you've just been of course speaking about. Uh, I did want to make a contribution to the debate, however, which I hope would be constructive. Yes. Um, on some of the fundamentals which I feel deeply uh, are being um, uh, miscast in the consultation document. Uh, some of these things have been touched upon by some of the panel members, uh, particularly uh, Sean and, uh, and Winston. Um, and they are really the fundamental compatibility of parallel criminal investigation and information retrieval processes. Uh, I would like to say, first of all, as a, as a citizen um, of the North of Ireland, I am deeply invested in dealing with the past, because I feel, and I think there's unanimity in the room on this, that unless we do, we cannot move on of course. as a society. But if we're going to do it, we need to do it properly. Uh, and the problem, the problems with the parallel processes are threefold. They are legal, practical, and philosophical. But let's deal with the practical. Winston has already pointed out the extreme unlikelihood of individuals coming forward in an information retrieval process in the context where there is a parallel criminal investigation process which leads only to one thing if its conclusion is successful, and that is the ignominy of a criminal conviction and serious personal consequences for those who are convicted. So from a, a pure practical point of view, the two cannot sit side by side because individuals in this society will not come forward to the information retrieval process while that threat remains. Now, it's much broader than the threat to the individual. The individuals we're talking about are people who are relatives, friends, associates, about whom they are going to be asked to speak and give information. And um, that information can be used in an investigative purpose. It must be. And um, not only that, it, it, it creates information about others who are engaged in serious misconduct in terms of the law. Uh, so, so how, we must ask ourselves, can one possibly expect the two to sit side by side? The, the practical <coughs> consequence of that is, in my view, is that the existence of the criminal process actually creates a hiding place for those <coughs> who want to hide. It gives them a reason. Any individual who has any personal risk or who might put anyone close to them at personal risk will be advised by any reasonable lawyer, don't give the information. Nobody's making you give the information. There are consequences potentially to you giving the information. So people will not give it. That means people, those people who should be accountable in every walk of our society, and they're all represented in this room, mm. will have a hiding place, a legitimate hiding place. 
because of the existence of the criminal process. So those are the practical difficulties of attempting to do both simultaneously. I would just like to touch on the legal issue. Um, I have to beg to differ, Sean, about the practicalities or even the legal possibility of ring fencing the information given to the Retrieval Commission from the criminal process. Um, I, I don't know how that can be done legally. No, no, no criminal process can be prevented legally from accessing available information because then it would be incomplete and the defendants in that process would be able to complain that there is information which could exonerate them to which they're not allowed access. So it simply cannot work in law. It would not be Article 2 compliant. But let's perhaps look at the bigger question, the philosophical question. What, what is a criminal process about? It's about two things. It's about retribution and it's about deterrence. That's why we have criminal justice processes in our societies. Deterrence is not an issue here because if all of those who have gone away, as they have said they've gone away, then deterrence doesn't matter. But it's about retribution. That's what it's about. But as Judith said, at the opening of this, it shouldn't be about retribution. So then why do we have a criminal process? And I think choices have to be made, really difficult choices. And when one looks at the choice, in my opinion, the better choice is to go with information retrieval and accountability through information retrieval in terms of who did what rather than necessarily attributing blame in a criminal context. And an inquiry for that, is that what you're saying, minus the... And the, the there are many ways and there are many worldwide examples of how those processes whether it have taken place, whether they be called uh, information retrieval or truth and reconciliation yes. or truth and recovery. Yeah. The problem with the criminal justice process is, as I have said, is that it, it will prevent the other process from having any meaning. And the other big question we have to ask ourselves is that, firstly, how many people will we actually convict? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry, but I have 30 plus years working in the criminal justice system uh, uh, six of those as the Director of Public Prosecutions. These are extremely difficult cases. The, the evidence is, we've already heard, evidence is lost, forensic evidence has gone missing, individuals die, memories fade. We can go on. Um, the, the number of convictions will be, will, be, will be minimal. And those who are convicted, their sentences will be limited, um, as they have to be because of the arrangement that was arrived at during the Friday agreement for entirely different purposes. Uh, <coughs> so, so one has to ask oneself when one weighs up the, in the balance the value of such a criminal justice process which will be flawed and limited against the damage it will do to an information retrieval or recovery, uh, information recovery process, in my opinion, um, the answer is, is, is only in one way. Um, but that requires real political leadership. Uh, it requires people turning around to their communities and saying, we can't deliver you retribution and justice as we know it in the criminal justice system, but we maybe can deliver you something else. Yes. And uh, that's, that's where this debate should go, in my opinion. Barra, thank you very much. Um, two hours is never going to be enough time for this conversation. Two weeks, two months, two years isn't going to be enough time. Uh, I am going to take uh, Dr. William Mitchell. I'm going to take Daniel Holder, uh, uh, I'm going to take Stan, and then we're going to have a closing comment uh, from, uh, I, w sorry, we're going to have some media questions. Uh, Vincent, are you, are you, do you need a question or are you happy enough with, uh, I, I don't mean right now, but uh, depends, on time. depends on time, okay. So we, we, we'll take uh, William Mitchell first, please, if we could. Observation, you you should under the cost when uh, we seen, seen that guy that we just did the whole process. Uh, I, I just like to remind people uh, of the revisit and the and look what happened to it. Yes. Uh, so far, uh, the discourse around the entire structure of the Stormhouse Agreement and the consultation we're currently going through 
I am yet to hear anybody speak positively about any of it. We have heard uh, in the past and today, even from the Victims Commission and myself, uh, victims aren't, don't have a corporate consensus on the way forward about justice and truth. Uh, we can't even get the full implementation across wider society about the legal definition of a victim. We have heard from the Chief Constable himself on the DPP that uh, the future for policing here should not be about uh, presently investigating the past. It's a waste of resources. We have heard from our two community activists that uh, in its current structure, ICIR on the HIU would be equivalent to uh, Turkey spoken for Christmas. Uh, let's not forget the contacts in December 2014, and we've heard from Meg here uh, that the official unionists actually walked away from it. The cynic would say that the uh, political expediency of the two main parties here simply shoehorned in the uh, Storm of House Agreement so that they get the welfare reform over the lane. Uh, one question I'd like to ask the panel here today. What hasn't been touched on is the formation uh, that seems core to the Stormer House Agreement, and that's the IRG. What aspect of reconciliation, given what I've just pointed out, does any of this Stormer House Agreement seek to address? And the 11 political appointments to the, IP, uh, the IRG, um, William. Yeah. So look, I'll take uh, Daniel Holder for a very quick comment. Daniel, Stan, and then we're going to let the, uh, the panel and we'll maybe have a, a final word from Chris Flatt as well on, on what he's heard this afternoon. We need to make it quick, Daniel. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, the the HIU is going to be able to open a whole lot of cases that come through in the HET. There's a number of avenues where it can do that. They're actually within the legislation. There is a provision if there's new evidence cases that were dealt with. And there's a second provision whereby there's a suspicion of uh, uh, reasonable suspicion of collusion cases can be reopened as well. And I did want to ask George about that because it's a power in there that will actually be vested um, in you as to whether you these cases can be reopened um, on the basis of suspicion of collusion. Now, uh, the, the, the bill um, conspicuously doesn't use that word, but it does define it, and it defines it in two parts, which is where um, an, a criminal offence was facilitated or the evading of justice was facilitated in relation to a death. That's, that's the first part of the definition. The second part of it is when it was done for, a, for an unlawful and proper purpose. I suppose the question is, um, can you outline the type of circumstances where it would have been lawful and proper, in your view, for a special branch to facilitate a criminal offence in relation to murder, or someone getting off and evading justice in relation to murder? Uh, would it be the possession that anything that was done under the authorisation of, of the handler was lawful and therefore can't be reopened? Okay, uh, thanks, Daniel. Uh, Stan? My name is Don Clarkery, my father was murdered in 1972, and I think that's too possible here. I have a HEP report done, so I did, and in my view it was pushed under the table. But there happened to be the HEP report, and in my view there was pages missing. I've asked since the PSNI to hand over the rest of the report, they've refused to hand it. I would like to know if you would look into this and give me the rest of that report, or why are they hate it? Sorry, do you mean, Stan, you've got a redacted report, or are there actual pages missing? I've got a report, but there's pages missing out of it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. Okay, so, so we've got questions on collusion, uh, on the reconciliation element of the, um, uh, the structure, the IRG, um, and, uh, and, uh, and Stan's question, very specific to his, to his father and the HET report that he got. George, you, you, you take Stan's question first, would you please? Yeah, uh, so Stan, I, I don't know the specifics, but I said in my opening remarks, it's not my job to hold information back, it's my job to provide it within the law, within the rules. So George Clark here is the Assistant Chief Constable, he's got responsibility for legacy investigations. You and he should have a conversation afterwards, and I will personally follow up with George about what's going on there, and if we can get you 
more information, we'll give it to you, simple as that. And if we can't, we'll explain why we can't. Okay. You happy enough with that, Stan? Yeah. The yeah. So there's collusion? the question, the collusion question. If you would take it, George, because it's specific to well, I think to the, investigation. Uh, I suppose the, the the bill is out for consultation, so we wouldn't take too much confidence about what will be in and out at the very end. But I, what I like is the principle that for the first time, and I agree with you, it's not referred to as collusion in the bill, but it's in everything other than me. We've got a legal standard that will have the uh, authority and the mandate of Parliament behind it that describes in effect what pollution is. And it's those two things that you talked about. It's about where a person has facilitated an offence or the avoidance of justice in relation to a death and did so with the intention of achieving an unlawful or an improper purpose. So almost whatever the definition is, the problem we have at the moment is you've got multiple definitions in existence You've got some definitions that are being applied by an ombudsman in good faith from Megal's perspective. I accept all of that, but without the examination of full judicial scrutiny and questioning and arguments for and against and all the rest of it. What we have in the legislation is in the draft is something that at least is going to bring clarity to that. So whether it's Michael or the director of the HIU, if it's not Michael. Um, <laughs> um, we'll at least have a piece of legislation rather than um, this ill-defined, and it's not even that it's ill-defined that there's multiple definitions, even the application of a definition is subject to different interpretation in different contexts, and, and, and I think that that is important that we're going to get clarity on that, hopefully for the first time. Okay. Um, you the, have I, I, I think there are just, can, can I just make a quick comment oh, okay. about uh, Barra's commentary? Barra, okay. Barra first made these comments publicly uh, a number of weeks ago. and The Irish News and BBC, uh, that's right. Uh, yeah, yeah, but, but I, I felt at the time there was an unhealthy, ill-thought-out rush to dismiss them in many political quarters. I want these institutions and this infrastructure to work. I don't really want to be sat here if the police authority haven't got rid of me in five or ten years' time. To board now. Uh, uh, please, please, please <laughs> board, thank you. It's been a long day. Um, but there, there are very valid issues, very well articulated by my learned friend, much better than, than I could, that actually my plea would be for the government to go away and address those and find the legislative creativity to square those circles mm. because Frank asked a very insightful question about we were all talking very positively about how we wanted this to work. Yeah. I think all of us in this room want something better than we currently have. Mm -hmm. Barra, with his wealth of experience in the criminal justice system and six years as Director of Public Prosecutions, has raised, without being fettered by holding the office anymore, some of very valid concerns. And I think they need to be taken seriously. I, I, I probably wouldn't be quite as pessimistic, and it's probably just because I don't understand it to the same degree, as he, that these cannot simply coexist. But certainly there is going to be major conflict and there is deconfliction that needs to require. Frank's other question about what isn't going to work about this or what, what, how all of this could stumble is around the, in my view, the time scale of five years is naively optimistic to the extent of buried one head, one's head in the sand. Depends which politician and official you speak to. Yeah. The £150 million pounds is going to be completely inadequate to address all of this. Mm. Now, the British government will say it was £150 million pounds extra as a pump primer to get this thing going. Local officials, including the Department of Finance, last minister been Sinn Féin, represented in the room here, mm. uh, would say that no, that was the sum total. It, is, it can't be the sum total if this infrastructure is going to work. Mm. It's going to need to be properly resourced and over a realistic time scale. Or what will happen is families will be let down once again. Of Victims course. will have be, see more prevarication, more delay, more unanswered questions. So resourcing, time scales and the legal uh, deconfliction that needs to be addressed as identified by the director or the former director. Uh, more uh, more important to get it right than to get it quick is what you're saying yeah. uh, in, in terms of Frank. Look, uh, I, I think uh, Chris, uh, maybe you might be best placed to answer William's question about 
what, what reconciliation comes from the IRG proposal. I think we're right that there are 11 political appointees to, the, to that reconciliation group. So if you would address that, then I'm going to come back. I think George has had his say. I'm going to let Sean, Winston, uh, Louise, and I would like Louise to say something about international learning, and, and Judith to have the last word if that's possible. So if, if Chris would, uh, would say something on the reconciliation element and what, what prospects for reconciliation uh, out of that proposal, and then we'll, we'll finish with our panel. So the, the, the proposal for the IRG is that um, it takes on board the two roles. One is to oversee the implementation of the other institutions, and then also to take the outworkings of those institutions at, at the end of their processes and look then at how they can uh, promote reconciliation. And I think we do have to see that being something that comes after the other processes have worked. I think it's quite reasonable to say that things like investigations themselves you know, didn't feel like something that's going to provide societal reconciliation, they may provide individual, <coughs> um, some individual comfort, but they could lead to very difficult uh, issues coming out into the open, I think we've all acknowledged that. So that process itself may not be a comfortable one, but the end of the process may provide the opportunity for the IRG, and I, I don't think we should dismiss something because it is, has political representatives and the political representatives are the people chosen by the electorate to speak on their behalf. And if those people can come together and take the outworkings of the other institutions and look at how that can help society reconcile, I think we should give that um, its opportunity. Okay, Chris, thank you. Um, I said that we would leave a little bit of room for, for a media question or questions. Um, John, you do want to ask a question. You've had your hand up a couple of times. Rebecca? Well, you're okay, Eamon? So we'll have John Ware uh, and Eamon Malley, and then we're going to have the closing comments from the panel. Thanks. Um, there's been a lot of uh, fine talk about the uh, importance of truth, candor, straight talking in uh, dealing with the violent legacy of the Northern Ireland conflict. Uh, so I'd like to put a straight question to, uh, to Sean. Sean, could you help the relatives uh, of the Birmingham pub bombings uh, that cost, as you know, 21 lives, could you help them understand why the IRA not simply sheltered the people who uh, planned and planted the bombs, but um, rehabilitated them. Thanks for that question, John. I'm not surprised you asked that question. Um, we have spent five years now, over five years, and I mentioned this earlier, in trying to develop mechanisms which would facilitate the flow of information. And that would include any uh, family, any event that happened during the conflict. You may be aware that our party, delegation of our party met the Birmingham Bombings recently. It was a very good meeting, a very mature meeting. And some request was asked of the party delegation. And some of the delegation were even born when the Birmingham bomb exploded. And they were told, as just a bad about now, we are serious, it's not playing talk, but we don't engage in playing talk at all. I don't know what you mean by playing talk. This is a serious attempt by our party to address this issue. It's not an easy issue for us to address, and I referred to that earlier. It'll be a very challenging issue for us all, not just Republicans, but the whole range of people who engage in the conflict, and Republicans will part of that conflict. It's also about society, a society which allowed the conditions to be created in the first place that led to a conflict erupting back in 1969. You know, those conditions were there even before I was born, and many of my generations were born, etc. So all those issues need to be addressed. So if you're asking me, if you're asking me, and I've been always at a prime for every time there's asked this, Republicans have good faith. But Republicans can trim to these mechanisms. And we're asked this many times during the negotiations. Mike Nasbitt was one of the people who consistently talked to us. And we're told 
If we develop these mechanisms and the human rights compliant manner, Republicans will not be found wanting. And what was interesting was the Birmingham families wanted the same as our family wanted, as any other family wanted, who had casualties in the cockpit, right? Access to legal aid, access to due process. You shouldn't have to wait on the British government facilitating or funding coroners and quests. It's a disgrace that they've had to wait 47 years in some cases in relation to it. So Republicans, John, listen. Yes. Republicans, because you asked the question, yes. and now you want to listen to the answer. Republicans will not be found wanting. That's why we put so much time and energy in developing those concepts. If we wanted to walk away, we could have walked away last July when the revelation was made about the ICI work. They were saying, here's a hole in the whole process, but we didn't. First of all, they approached Chris with myself afterwards, and Chris will verify this. And I said to Chris, and he also said to yourself, Tony, problem solving. we are in problem solving mode. We want this sorted. Does that sound like somebody who wants to run away from a process? I don't think so. I didn't say that. I, I'm familiar, by the way, with the details of this conflict, believe me. Um, I just want to be clear, is, is your answer then uh, that the relatives of their answers are conditional on the other side, principally the British government, doing what you would regard as their bit? You've already got my answer, John. Republicans will not be found wanting right across the range of mechanisms. Okay. Uh, Iman Mali, and then we're going to finish with the panel. Uh, we wait for the mic, Eamon. Yeah. Now, Eamon, a quick question because we're we're running out of time. Raymond on my right has laid quite a serious charge potentially at the feet of uh, the ombudsman, the police ombudsman. He also suggested that the police ombudsman specifically uh, imparted information to the DPP of the day, and the chief constable made an observation about the. On Busman against the backdrop of his findings. Now those are three, four pretty key people in this room, all in the one mesh and the one net. I, I think that the Busman, there's a nose on the Busman to clear this up against the backdrop of what's been said. That's an observation. Question. I want to ask Chris Flat. Where does Theresa May stand on the question of statute of limitations? Even if she were mindful to support a statute of limitations, which would amount to an amnesty for former parliamentarians and former police officers and soldiers who wronged, would the Tory Tea Party Brigade endure in that situation? Okay, Yemen, we've got the we've got the question. Okay, Chris, do you want to answer that one? Um, can you respond to Yemen? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and and uh, uh, Ma I think Michael will give the clarification to the other part of it, but we don't have time for it in this conversation. Uh, I'm afraid. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think uh, in terms of the statute of limitations, we have said that we think that uh, there'd be real difficulties in applying that here because it doesn't appear that there's support for it in Northern Ireland. But we are having a consultation and we're asking for right, and we're not second guessing what so the outcome. Exactly. Um, and I don't think I'm in a position to speak to the Prime Minister. Okay, Chris. Okay, so uh, we'll, we, we'll have a final comment from Winston, Louise, and, and the final, final comment from Judith. And uh, so, Winston. I suppose my uh, reflections on, the, on today's event are that uh, this has probably been. Uh, one of the most honest, um, candid, and uh, inclusive uh, conversations uh, that I certainly have been involved in. Uh, I hope we can find a way to uh, take the discussions uh, that have been had today and some of the issues and, and some of the uh, thoughts, if you like, uh, that have came out of it um, to uh, another debate to another venue. Uh, I think the consultation process that's ongoing at the moment uh, will benefit hugely uh, to listen to uh, the people uh, in, this, in these rooms. Uh, but I also want to say that uh, unless we deal with this issue 
uh, around how we deal with the past, we can forget about reconciliation. We can forget about reconciling communities. We need to find a way to release communities from this uh, total uh, entrapment almost of, of attitudes and of uh, arguments that are continuing to perpetuate uh, what I see are, are self-serving interests in some respects. Uh, unless we get to a stage whereby uh, we can find a collective we and get on the, uh, a single page on what consensus might look like, given that uh, the idealism uh, that uh, some have expressed around how we should deal with the past doesn't exist. And quite frankly, I don't think it's possible, never remain feasible. Uh, it is in my view that the most effective way of dealing with this process uh, will be to have a bottom-up approach that has a top-down um, combination to it. But I think that the people in this room today have certainly given me a lot of food for thought and I think they've been uh, some immensely brave comments made. Thanks, Winston. Um, Louise, Sean had said earlier, and uh, we, we'll keep these closing comments as brief as we can, that you can't bury this, and, and, and that is international experience. And you have, you, you have studied a number of the international conflicts. Um, if, if you were to pick out uh, a piece of learning from those travels across international conflict zones, what would it be? You better, yeah. Bring that around, yeah, sure. just a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think I've been really struck listening to the very rich conversations today that many of the international lessons I had in mind to mention are things we already know from our own experiences here. We've already had a long process with multiple mechanisms to deal with the past, and there have been problems with those processes. And I think in response to Frank's question about what the risks are for the mechanisms, we kind of know from some of the experiences we had already. And so I think what I would highlight in relation to international learning also applies to our own learning from here. And it's that if we set up mechanisms, they need to be independent. They need to be properly resourced and have adequate powers to be able to fulfill their functions. They need to be designed in a consultative way. And I think we're very fortunate that we're, after what's been quite a long process, going back to you know, at least 10 years, if not longer, we're at a stage now where we have a draft bill and we have space to feed into it. But I think even after this consultation process, this dialogue needs to keep going. It needs to keep going through the legislative drafting process. And if we get to the stage where we have mechanisms, those processes still need to engage in outreach. They'll have to develop codes of ethics, codes of practice. There needs to be a multiplicity in voices involved at all those stages. And I think what's also quite positive from international experiences is, yes, there are problems with having different mechanisms functioning in parallel to each other. But I think international practice says we need holistic approaches. We know from our own record here, having piecemeal bits trying to do different things doesn't work. So it is useful that we have an oral history archive, mechanisms trying to deal with reconciliation, trying to deliver truth, trying to deliver justice. How we tease out how they work is a design challenge, and that's something we need to take forward through this consultation. Louise, thank you. And Judith? I'm going to fly oh. slightly in the face of a lot of this afternoon's conversation by saying, actually, this isn't rocket science. It's complicated, and there are lots of very, very able people in this room and outside it who can design this in the right way to work. And I think everything that you've heard this afternoon tells us that. But at a really simple human level, it's not rocket science. People want proper access to fair, competent systems that enable them to get information if they want it, see acknowledgement of harm done, decent services to help with the many, many harms that people carry, psychologically, financially, and personally. And actually, good services, good mental health services, decent justice processes that people can start to learn to trust. And some, and people are realistic, some access to a more truthful, honest, difficult, but ultimately balanced look at what happened in the past. That is very doable, we said about it. It's not comfortable, but it's doable. And for the most part, whilst people 
want different things, there are themes there. Choices and options are on offer in this package. Choices to go to an oral history archive if you wish to, and to use it to understand other people's narratives. Choices to engage with information retrieval if you wish to. Choices to engage in a process at a civic and personal level with, with, a, with a thematic look at acknowledgement. And even the justice bit of it, in those cases where there is not going to be a prosecution, it's choice whether people get those reports or choose not to have them. So, not rocket science. Thematically, people want the same things. They're things we expect to have in a functioning society, and choices and options for individuals is the best way to go. And honestly, most of what we've heard in this room today would take us in that direction. So, I think we've done way harder things. I think there's excellent people here who can make it happen. Um, it takes a bit of courage to, to live with some of the risks, but I think the risks of not doing it are far greater. Judith, thank you. I know I said I would give you the last word, but Sean Murray has had his hand up at the end here, so I think you want to say a few last words, Sean, if that's okay. Look, some volley concerns have been raised um, regarding these mechanisms, and I, I share those concerns. In fact, Professor Lee Bradley here, I've designated about 23 serious issues of concern regarding <laughs> the drop ball, and, and you're probably aware of them. This is the drop ball here. It's 120 pages of complex legal concepts. You probably see it inscribed here, Shane Finley. That's because Barney kept getting leaflets and information dropped to his letterbox. I know what to say to this drop ball. There's some letterbox Barney was there. And, uh, no, but seriously. We have those concerns, but we need to come to this constructively because this is the only show in town. And it may be the only show in town for this generation in terms of being in the past. There's too many failed attempts in the past. Expectations have been raised. And who are we to stop or deny those people access to the structures that I've seen in the Storm of House Agreement? Are they perfect? Of course they're not perfect. There's a negotiation involved. People are putting forward different points of view, different perspectives. But is there enough in the Storm of House Agreement mechanisms to take us forward? We firmly believe there are. Now, there are some serious concerns. Chief Council mentioned some of the resources. 150 million won't furnish enough money for the HIU alone, never mind the rest of the concepts. Five years won't cover it. In fact, double that, you may have a problem in relation to completing those cases. There may be legal challenges from some people who have already had a HET report. They say, well, that, that was a great report. I'm not happy with that. I want the HET to look at it. But we can deal with all of those issues if we're in the right frame of mind. If we're in problem solving mode, and I think most of the key people who have negotiated these issues are in problem solving mode. What's the biggest threat to it? I think it's resources. Does a political wall exist within the British government to push this forward in light of the lobby by the British Armed Forces, etc., by way of the statute of limitations? That, that needs to be seen and needs to be addressed. Also, I think the concern is the lobby to detach political unionism from the storm of agreements must be faced down. Because that would be totally unfair to many of the families who are sitting late in the point of the bottom of families are faced into an inquest 47 years after the death of their loved ones. Just to to your point, Barry, when you talked about the information, it's in the provisions within the bill that that information is seen and it can't be given to any justice agencies. Now, if you have an issue with that or you think that's problematic, use the consultation process. It's bringing me on the last, last point. Barry. Really the last point. <laughs> the consultation process is vital. It's there for everyone. Please use that consultation process. Give them your view, your point of view. If you have concerns, raise those concerns in the consultation process. If you need help or assistance, our party's only too willing to help, and our parties would probably be a similar game. There are many NGOs and groups out there who will provide that backup. Because we're dealing with complex legal concepts, and people need that help, need that assistance to make a submission to the consultation. But please use this opportunity to have your say in relation to what's contained in the Stormhead Agreement by way of the legacy mechanisms. Okay. 
I want to thank Sean, I want to thank Winston, I want to thank the Chief Constable George Hamilton, Louise and uh, the Victims Commissioner Judith Thompson. I want to thank you. Uh, I think what we proved today is that you can have on this very tough and raw subject a reasonable and a measured conversation. And if people want this process to work, think back to what I said at the beginning. What seemed impossible became possible. Don't give up uh, because there is a chance that with the right thinking and the right shape of a process that we might get somewhere with this. But thank you all for your contributions.